What's up amigos, Commander Jaime here today and we're going to go over a premium deck profile that actually topped in a recent Visions tournament. Uh, we actually have our boy Evan that did so well. Uh, not only that, but he's also a great rider on the Grand Blue block that I host actually. So Rogue of the Seven Seas, he's the one that is famous for the Night Rose Encyclopedia. He's also famous for the Night Rose Hazard build. So we're going to cover that into his experiences and why he had some of the card choices so let's get right into it and so right off the back you can see that his setup is very different and honestly if you look at this list you're like what is going on <laughs> there is night rose there is beatrice and there is sarzan involved and as you can see it's a combo combination of the three and really what it does at first you look at this you can't necessarily just pick up the deck and actually expect to know how every little thing functions and also like do really well with it you I mean you can start like doing some things and learn as you go but there's so much depth to this deck and grand blue is already a clan that has depthness into it um but going into it a little more let's start with the great threes and go from there and so with the great threes we already see that there's a split between night rose and beatrice and at first i had talked to him about this and he even was a little bit hesitant about doing this ratio he wanted to go first with the fort night rose and then the two beatrice but somehow make room for the third one and as you can see even skull dragon got reduced to two so that split had to happen in order to have the uh three beatrice and what he found himself is that with the mulligan in each game that he had, he had a really good chance of really dictating his first grade three right target as well. And so he had, in essence, an option to be able to ride Night Rose to have a more of aggression. And he had the option to go into Beatrice to have a more defensive option. Uh, and certain matchups may actually dictate where it actually matters. And for the most part, both of them serve the similar purposes with those small differences being a key factor. Uh, and so with that, you know, Beatrice is part of the new clan selection. So I'll go over some of the skills since people may not know them. It has three skills. The first one's a Vanguard Circle and a Rigard Circle. Basically, when it's placed, you can Soul Blast for one, revive any card that you want from the drop zone onto Rigard Circle. And that's very powerful. And I'm going to actually have some interactions. But what's really cool is that this fulfills the role that Colin Bar can provide during your battle phase. And so when we have Night Rose as Vanguard, you know, whether it's your first grade three turn or you're doing a bad bounty where you rewrite Night Rose and then attack, Night Rose will kind of last to call Colin. Now we would usually use a column bar from behind to actually call another regard to the other front row. Now we can do that with Beatrice and instead of using a counter blast, we use a soul blast. And so depending on your resources, that is an option. It gives us flexibility and it's a great card and there's more interactions with that skill, but I'll get to it once I get to it. Uh, the second one is also really good and it's a Vanguard skill, um, skill only. And so basically what it does, it gives plus 5k to all ghosties and plus 5k shield to all of them as well. Not only that, but it gives them the intercept ability. And so you have cards, let's say your grade one ghosties, your grade, two, grade zero ghosties, like your heal triggers that can now have intercept in the front row. You can intercept with them and actually have big shield. Uh, it gets power plus shield as well. So you really have a lot of defensiveness and in certain matchups, you can go into protect too. And that might be actually relevant just depending on the matchup. Like if you're facing against a clan that retires or locks or buying stuff away from you, that might not be the right call. And so you fall back into the protect one, whether you're still on Night Rose or on Beatrice. But you know, when decks that don't retire and you would appreciate the extra shield coming from like your field instead, that Protect 2 might actually come in, in vital at that point. And there are other units that we have that honestly just have high shield, like the Crane Elementals that also just help. And we'll go a little more into that once we get to that. And then lastly, the skill, the third skill is basically when it sees one of your cards being retired by a card ability, you can kind of blast one and revive a card with ghosting a name that is a great um that is actually less of a grade than the unit that was retired and so for example to give you a, a visual let's say your skull dragon attacks as regard it gets retired because of its own skill guess what beatrice can proc you can counter blast one call a grade two or less ghost the unit and go from there and then you can keep doing that uh as much as you want it's not once per turn so you can see that chain attack um uh, going from grade three grade two grade one to even grade zero uh that actually helps with their Zazan engine just having your vanilla so so you have actually a ghosty heal trigger that's going to get bigger with um cyclones being face up and so with also Beatrice giving power those units can actually hit at least over that 13k threshold and then more you can probably get more um shield value out of your work too as well so those are things just to have in mind and you can start seeing how Beatrice can still really fulfill that vanguard role but also have that rearguard role as well and so Finishing up with the great threes, we have two Skull Dragons, the White Knights, uh, one Night Storm, and so Night Storm is very essential to attack extend. 
we have cards like Beatrice and Columbar that are able to call, but they're only able to call when they're placed. And so that's where we're cards like Night Rose, but not only that, but with Night Storm, at the end of the battle, you can counterblast and call those units and then further extend your attacks at that point. And you can keep doing this with the Sorzan engine too, where Sorzan, again, is an on-place card that calls units too. And so you can also use Sorzan uh, with Night Storm to actually extend further attacks at that point. You're calling more Vanillas, providing more columns to work with, and really more attacks. And again, you can extend into those units where instead of using counter blast, you may be able to use cell blast instead. And so you're able to get more attacks and you're not limited anymore to the number of counter blasts that you have, which honestly, that's the only resource that your opponent can truly control is your counter blast. If you have enough soul and you're building it up and then you're replenishing it, then you have total control in that respect too. So that's why it's so powerful. And then Night Storm, oh not Night Storm, Skull Dragon. And so one of the things that I've saw, seen over the past year, you know, before even Night Rose came out, we had Kakaitis and in premium, we had the four Skull Dragons to pair up with the Megiddo Skull Dragon turn. Very powerful win con, but as we got bad bounty, that started changing things. We've seen Deckless actually reduce Skull Dragon to three, and now we're starting to see where um, Evan actually just reduced it to two. And honestly, you really do just need the two Skull Dragon. You can fall back to a third one just to make sure you have that copy, making it easier to see it. Maybe you want to hit the damage zone, uh, little things like that. But with the case with the rest of the deck, Skull Dragon is very powerful, but is not as needed because your vanillas are getting bigger and bigger as well. So there's a lot of other cards that he can fall back to. So where he has two Skull Dragons and it just works well with him. And so ultimately his winning image strength, um, describes where he has bad bounty. He has multiple Skull Dragon attacks. He even has Cody the Ghosty and I'll get to him when I get to him, but <laughs> to have a very powerful attack turn. Um, now going into the grade twos, we have a lot of one offs, but we'll start with the the staple, which is Columbard, our boy. So for Columbard, again, Panel Blast one, fetch Sazan, call it to regard and go ham. <laughs> But really, you can fetch anything you want and revive anything from your drop zone. And that's still powerful, regardless of the pieces that you need. And so that's why you play four, and he plays four. So, And then the one else we have Ghost Ship, where it's an attacker that's a beater that can give you draw advantage without costing a counter blast or a soul blast. We have Greed Shade that lets you, you know, build the quality of your hand, get some pieces, mill a little bit, all that kind of stuff, get the heal triggers, you know, all that. Greed Shade is still valuable, but it's not as necessary because. You got to keep in mind that there's only so much room in this deck build too, so he was able to reduce it to one. So Greed Shade is more of a nice to have more than a necessity in this deck build. And part of it is because of the Zarazan engine that really, really pushes that forward. And as you can see, before I get to Cannoneer, we have the one of the poker. We have King Serpent. So King Serpent is obviously replenishing our resources, so charge and counter charge when it's called from the drop. And you can extend further attacks with it during the battle phase. So when you do your column call with Night Rose, you can have it in the back and then you can call a Night Storm and then really extend from there. You're refunding a counter blast. You can get some soul there for Zorzan, for Beatrice to be able to extend as well. Um, with Obadiah, when you do a massive field call, you can replenish your counter blast from the Obadiah turn and get a soul and then that soul can be used for a different card too. So you can really have those flexibility options and King Serpent is really nice to have as a great two just to be able to counter charge and soul charge. It is not GB restricted because it's an old card. So you can do this on your first grade three turn or even grade two, two, grade two turn with like Negar Bone or even Night Rose Call and really start refunding your resources. And then you, because you have Zarzan, you have GB Live active as well. And so your other cards like Nightstorm might be relevant on reviving King Serpent during your first grade three turn, which is kind of ham if you really think about it. It's, it's really cool. And lastly with a poker, um, um, again, Chaos got support in the Clan Selection Plus, so he was really worried about that, and so he decided to throw in the poker. He, uh, to my knowledge, he didn't face Chaos. Uh, I saw his matchups and doing the interview with him, and it just worked out for him, but you don't have to play poker, but he did it just in case. And then lastly, the two Cannoneers, which is something, uh, oh, and Jesse the Ghostie as well. But I'll cover Cannoneers and go to Jesse the Ghostie. So Cannoneers um, are very important. And so as people have started to find out, we have the Negro Lily pay, uh, play with Cannoneer again. So with Beatrice, you know, Negro Lily as part of the cause is Counter Blast, Retire, Regard, Call, Any Normal Ghostie. Guess what? Beatrice is a normal ghosty. When um, Beatrice is called during your panel, uh, opponent's turn, you can still proc its ability to Soul Blast 1, revive the Cannoneer. Cannoneer, you can hollow it and then of course pay the Counter Blast skill where you can retire one of your opponent's 
uh, Rigards, and then of course draw a card. So you get advantage back, but not only that, you disrupt their plays, you blow up their formations. Uh, it's a powerful pseudo denial Griffin play that now every Grand Blue variant has, and that's why he still has it. And honestly, it helps with those matchups that are just very tough. And so you think about maybe Fenrir, for example, where if they have that one Glyphnir ready to go, if you could just pop that dude, you're 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 good. <laughs> you know, um, if they have double, you have access to a double Negro Lily Cannoneer play. So you can retire both front rows if you really need to. So that option is there as well. And so that's why he plays two Cannoneers. You you technically need only one and you can reuse the same Cannoneer. Um, but he just wanted to make sure he had that pretty easily. So he added the second one. And so that's why he made that room. And I would agree with him because it's such a powerful play just to have there. So you're not like as focused. Like I really need to keep my certain pieces into drop zone to make sure I have that play. Um, especially in a meta game where he had mentioned it, he recognized and saw the trends, especially with our formats, is that the meta game is really consistent aggression or a one shot turn deck kind of hit. So, you know, people from zero to six damage kind of thing. And so either of those two rounds, that's where he's like, I need to be able to have be prepared for certain decks and you know with combo decks that have that one rigor or two rigor that really depend on those one shot kills that's where cannoneer helps you with that you know and then the consistent aggression is the zarzan engine that helps with the night rose engine itself so he has a really good balance with that and honestly it's a really good pick uh in this meta game in my opinion especially if you have experience with grand blue this is a really solid pick in my opinion i would honestly played Night Rose in my example, or I would fall back to Fenrir because I also play Fenrir. Um, but it just depends on your, you know, you're comfortable if you're confident enough with actually playing the deck well, and it takes time with Grand Blue, obviously. Um, but I digress. <laughs> anyway, going to Jesse the Ghosty. Now, Jesse the Ghosty, he's playing a one of and has two unique skills that are different that you would expect in Grand Blue. The first skill is that you retire two rear guards on your board. You can call this from drop zone to rear guard. So it's a drop zone skill that's able to superior call itself without using any counter blast, any soul blast, which is handy. But then at the same time, like, why would you do that? You know, <laughs> why would you retire two of your guys and then revive this little ghosty? And that the second ability is actually where it may consider you too as well, where basically when it attacks, you can actually, um, basically at the end of the battle, it can reti it retires itself. And then because it retired, so it checks with the hard once per turn clause, where if you haven't had counter charge with this card, with this name yet, you can counter charge. So this helps you extend more attacks at this point. Not only that, but it also gets plus 5k. So on its own, it's going to be nine plus 5k, 14k. So it hits that 13k mark. But not only that, if you're on Night Rose or on Beatrice, it's going to get a plus five. And if for whatever reason you revived it with Obadiah, it's going to get another plus five. So you're easily hitting a 19k attacker. And then anything additional just goes on top of that as well. And so one key thing to also know is that Evan has done plays where he has his Obadiah turn and thanks to the Sarzan engine flipping a Cyclone, when he goes into first stride, he's able to massively call four to five rear guards on his first stride turn. So then that allows him to call a certain number of rear guards. And let's say he wants to retire certain units already with Cannoneer and he has a counter blast. So he's going to call Cannoneers to retire your opponent's board a little bit. Uh, that disruption and other cards, maybe like a King Serpent and counter charge, soul charge, you know, things of that nature or tier. Um, and what he can do is really retire those units immediately and bring Jesse the Ghosty as putting those units back into the drop zone to be reused that turn or for the next turn guaranteed, right? And so your drop zone is there just to be able to access with cards like Negro Lily during your opponent's turn. And then of course, during your turn, if you want to extend more attacks and Jesse the Ghosty helps with giving you the counter charge back to further extend attacks. So you can easily get four, five, six, seven attacks on your first try with only working with like one, two, three counter blasts. It just depends on your situation too. So that's why Go uh, Jesse the Ghost is actually very pretty important at this point. And <laughs> so having the one-up is actually nice. Now going into the, the great ones, as you can see, a lot of it is geared to Cray Elementals. Uh, we see with the Zazan, the Tempest Sphere, we see the four Makira. Uh, not only that, but we have the two tiers and the one Grand Blue, uh, Grand Blue Vanilla unit. And so with this is more geared to the Zarzan engine to make it sure it's consistent enough to happen. As you can see, there's no vanillas in the grade two slots no vanillas in the grade three slots it's just purely in the grade ones and of course our triggers too like rick the ghost these are heal triggers and we have some of the crit triggers that are vanilla he chose multiple arts too uh, that could be a strategy to confuse the opponents like how many crits are you actually playing uh so just keep that in mind as well and what's really cool with tier as you can see we're not playing grenache and the thing with grenache such a great card don't get me wrong 
But the thing is, you have to realize what these units that refund resources and when they actually go off. And so Grenache would not go off until the end of your turn to give you two counter blasts back. Tear and King Serpent, as soon as they are placed, they give you that resources back. And Tear is basically Soul Blast 2 and then counter charge for every card face up in the G zone. That is a Cray Elemental. That counts your Cyclones, that counts your Gleam, for example, as your G Guard. And you are uh, Rectum, for example. And so you can counter charge really anywhere from like one to like five counter blasts, <laughs> you know, and really just go from there and just be mindful of your soul. So you may be able to resolve this once, but there are all the cards that build up your soul and you can rewrite too with that bounty. You can also have cards that like those, the crit that goes into soul as well, just to build up that soul. So just be mindful of that and you'll be good to go. And you can use tier really to further extend your turn where your opponent may have given you one counter blast, you know, or your opponent may have denied you counter blast and you have, you know, three, four face down counter blasts. You can actually use the grade one negro bone, as we can see, that's the last grade one in the slot that you can discard a card in superior call anything from your drop zone. And what's really nice, um, even if you're at the 10 less, you can still revive a grade one. And guess what? Tier is a grade one. So you can actually revive tier in counter charge and then use your strides counter blast to like build a field and really go from there. And you still have another kind of less to work with after that. If you like, let's say, for example, counter charge two, right? Or if you had the, the three already, you counter charge three. And you can see where it's like, wow, I have a lot more control if I use tier because I'm using the Sorzon engine because more than likely I'm going to have face up Cray Elementals in my G zone. And so that's why tier has become more important in this build without needing Grenache. And I hope that makes sense too. And so going into the critical triggers or just the triggers in general, it's an interesting lineup. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in fact, Coded to Ghosty is a, an interesting pick, and so we can see right off the back, it's 4 heal, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, basically 11 crits with the 1 drop PG, very high crit count, as what Evan calls a compression, you're filtering, you're thickening, you're going to see triggers on your drive checks, especially if you're going into Obadiah like 95% of the time in your first drive because of the Sarzan engine just making that even better and stronger and easier for you to set up and really get your resources and keep up with the metagame and all that kind of stuff. It's just like you're going to hit crits in your drive checks and it's like holy crap. And what's really cool is the Coded the Ghosty tech. Now when I saw this I was like Coded the Ghosty? Like I haven't seen that card since it came out. This guy came out when Taro came out back in GBT 08 days. <laughs> uh, and even in the day when it came out, it wasn't really used to be honest. And what it does is basically when it sees a unit retired, uh, it actually can counter blast and revive itself. And it had that retired unit also has to be not ghosty. And it's like, Coded the Ghosty when he came out, it's like, oh, he's a Ghosty, I could use him in a Ghosty deck. And it's like, no, if your Ghosty is retired, his skill will not proc because he has to see a non-Ghosty retire. And then at the same time, why would you spend a counter blast reviving a 4k crit trigger? <laughs> you know? Um, but what he made me realize, and when I saw his game on um, on Twitch, uh, he used Coded the Ghosty for two things. The first thing is that you want to have access to the Negro Lily can near play. Negro Lily's cost is not only counter blast one, but it requires a regard to be required. That is not part of the skill, it's actually part of the cost. So if you do not have any regards, you do not have access to that play and you can actually lose that game. And so cards like Vanagander, for example, can retire some of your board. And at that point, it's like, oh crap, I, I don't have access to that pseudo denial Griffin play. I guess I lose, right? And so with that, when they, let's say even a retiring clan retires a unit, especially if it's a non-go C unit, you can actually bring back Cody and it'll be a new body for you to be able to have access to thanks to Negro Lily right there at that point. So Negro Lily can then be G guarded with and then kind of blessed retire the Cody to bring back the Beatrice and then the Canier and go from there. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is I never thought that I would ever see this in my entire life with Cody <laughs> is like attack extending. Yes, attack extending. So he can be an attacker and you ask yourself, like, how is this little guy going to actually be worth a counter blast to further extend attacks? And it's because one of a um, couple things, right? We have Night Rose, we have Beatrice giving them power plus 5k. So he becomes a 9k hitter on his own. And then we have our boosters. We have vanilla boosters. We have Makira. We have the heal trigger that gets plus five for every cyclone. So your booster is really making up for the power there. So let's say, for example, you have three cyclones or three elements. Yeah, three cyclones up. So now your vanilla units are getting plus 15K. So if you have basically, uh, let's say Makira. So eight 
with a 4K Mix 12. Then it's gonna get a plus five from Beatrice because it's a, it's a ghostly and rig two as well. So that's another 10K. Not only that, now you're getting plus 15K from the Cyclones. You're easily hitting 30K up. And then you got more Cyclones being flipped up to like maybe four copies. And then if you're on Night Rose when you're doing a bad bounty turn two, the whole column gets another plus five on top of that as well, just to make sure. And it's just like, wait, what? <laughs> uh, so that column actually becomes threatening and you can start really taking some shield with that. Um, it's a phenomenal card and i never really thought about it that way and i was just like wow and i saw his games and he was actually using cody to further attack extend and actually setting up for his board just to make sure he had access to that play and so um honestly it, it was a real blast interview in evan and if you guys want to take the time to read the interview article that i did with him i will put it in the description too you can take your time with reading there's a lot of content he went over there he went with a lot of matchups uh gavrail for example nudo from morakumo if i pronounced that correctly uh you got other decks too that are like you know songster loop for example harry loop you got these decks that honestly have this like loop or one shot or a consistent aggression he faced those decks too and what's really cool is that he went undefeated until the finals he lost to morakumo uh, and honestly, it was mainly part of it because his setup wasn't as great and he kind of underestimated some. He made some mistakes and he realized that he can learn from that too as well. And what he, one thing that he said that too, he he really saw a lot of resources. He used the blog, he used videos from like myself, Solom, Vanguard Insider, a lot of people, Reddit of course, seeing the Japanese format, seeing the English format, just really preparing himself. And that's something that I would like to encourage you people, you know, if you plan to attend an event and do plan to do well, prepare right and you want to see the different resources that you have and really realize what deck you're using what people are using and what they've seen success paying attention to the metagame and everything as we can see clan selection has changed a lot of things and then we're going to see another change once volume 2 comes out and then of course as dokea uh not Stokea, as overjust stuff comes out Stokea cards can change this as well and then of course the other nations are going to change because they're getting now overdressed cards so it's a really dynamic time and i had the pleasure to chat with him thanks again to vision uh to be able to host these events even during this pandemic uh in my area i still it's it's really hard to go in public still so it's not really like locals and everything and then i'm sure canada where evan's from is even stricter too so we rely on online stuff now so this is really cool that vision still keep doing tournaments and then congrats again to evan alberto uh you did awesome amigo i'm glad not only you're a writer for the grand blue blog but you did well representing grand blue and i love that and so i just wanted to get some time to share this with you guys Hope you enjoyed it. And then, you know, if you like the profile, if you like this video, give it a like down. It helps a lot with the channel. Of course, not to mention if you guys have some thoughts, some opinions, or even some questions, you know, like what are some things that like, you know, the G zone is pretty self-explanatory, so I didn't go over it as much. Um, but if you have some questions, I'll be free, uh, feel free to ask and I'll be able to answer that as well. And if I can't, I can always just reach out to Evan. Um, he'll be happy to help out with any suggestions or even like answering anything into. And if you know any Grand Blue players or even players that would just would like to see this video because it's, you know, Know, competitive at the same time it has grand blue stars on all that shenanigans beatrice uh feel free to share it you know i appreciate that and then of course subscribe amigos so see ya bye